Good morning, everyone. I'm here to introduce our speaker today, as well as our Greenblatt Award recipient. So we'll start with the award recipient. Dr. Saki is a rare combination of intelligence, humility, compassion, and tenacity, who has the power to move mountains. In addition to her strong performance in clinical care and teaching, she has a unique perspective about challenges and that she truly views them as opportunities for growth. She is the calm in any storm and the bright light who leads her patients, their families, and co-fellows to safety. She is currently a second year child and adolescent psychiatry fellow at UCLA, who was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Saki attended the University of Pennsylvania, where she studied health and societies, Africana studies, and gender studies. A college course about race, class, and poverty in the United States inspired Dr. Saki to move to New Orleans, recently post Hurricane Katrina, to teach high school. After foregoing many lesson plans for impromptu questions and answers from her students about dating, sex, friend groups, and mental health, she decided that she loved talking with kids and wanted to do it for a living. She attended the University of Pennsylvania for medical school and remained for psychiatry residency. During residency, Dr. Saki co-founded the Penn Psych Cultural Psychiatry Certificate, started the resident recruitment committee, and served as psychotherapy resident coordinator. Dr. Saki has received the APA SAMHSA Minority Fellowship Award and the Penn Psychiatry Outstanding Senior Resident Award. At UCLA, Dr. Saki is involved in the psychotherapy area of distinction, new center for psychoanalysis, child and adolescent psychotherapy program, and helped to start the parent infant mental health area of distinction. She was recently awarded the prestigious Alexandra Simmons Fellowship from the Association of Women Psychiatrists. Dr. Saki currently helps to lead the Circle of Security Parenting Program in the Perinatal Intensive Outpatient Program as well. The Greenblatt Award is given annually to a second year child psychiatry fellow who best exemplifies the qualities of Dr. Greenblatt's dedication to the lives of children and families. These characteristics include deeply humane commitment to children requiring psychiatric care, exceptional talent and skill in clinical work, unusual sensitivity and concern for the needs and feelings of others, whether they be patients and families or students and colleagues. Congratulations to Dr. Saki, a tireless advocate for improving the lives of children and families. She is deserving of this most special award in honor of Dr. Greenblatt. Thank you. I'll give this to you later when I see you, of course. So now to introduce the grand round speaker of this morning, the infamous Dr. Sansi Jacobson. She received her undergraduate degrees from Dartmouth College and Oxford University and completed her medical training at the University of Pittsburgh. Upon graduation, she remained at UPMC where she has served as program director for the child and triple board training programs for the past decade. Clinically, Dr. Jacobson devotes her efforts to the prevention of adolescent suicide through the STAR Center. Academically, she is an associate professor and co-chair of the WELL Committee, where she oversees well-being initiatives to support the second largest GME in the nation, with more than 2,000 residents and fellows across the UPMC healthcare system. In these roles, she has earned herself a reputation for innovative initiatives, such as the AACE ACE Track, curbside, and the Well Toolkit, which received more than 17,000 internet visits in the past two years. Nationally, Dr. Jacobson served as co-chair of the ACAP Training and Education Committee and is known for her fierce media and mental health advocacy around the popular Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why, with a viral op-ed and media presence from NPR to Teen Vogue. More recently, she has focused her efforts on the evolving field of physician well-being and has been an invited speaker at national conferences, academic institutions, and a recent NIH grand round. On a personal note, Dr. Jacobson is an incredible force for good. In addition to being a talented clinician, educator, and personal mentor of mine and many others, Dr. Jacobson has this magical ability to connect with others in a profoundly meaningful way. She's the ultimate team player, brilliant beyond measure, 
and possesses the superpower to build community wherever she goes. We are really honored today. We're just so honored to welcome her. And she's going to present the Greenblatt Lecture for Grand Rounds on Physician Wellbeing, The System Feels Broken, and Sometimes We Do Too. Welcome. Wow, that was uh, really such an honor. Thank you so much, um, Misty, and congratulations, Dr. Saki. Uh, it gives me so much um, hope about the future to see uh, the next generation of physicians doing such amazing things so early in their career. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have spent the last uh, couple of days with you all in your community. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to get started in the interest of time and I did set an alarm so we can have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, that being said, if you uh, put your questions in during the chat, Misty's going to help me out. Um, in, in fielding those questions, and she's welcome to interrupt me as we go. So let's get started. Um, physician well-being, the system feels broken, and sometimes we do too. Uh, this is a picture of my younger son, Wilder, and yes, you are now about to trust a child psychiatrist who named her son Wilder. All right, let's get going. So I have no disclosures other than thank you so much for the Greenblatt Honorarium and all of the support and the wonderful hosting that's happened over the past two days. You are an amazingly spirited community. All right, so what are we gonna do today? We're gonna keep it real, we're gonna keep it relevant, and hopefully at the end, um, those of you who are interested in well-being advocacy will walk away with some interesting and actionable ways to improve physician well-being um, and maybe uh, feedback to other systems about how to fight the good fight. So I was an English major, and so these are my chapters of the talk. We're going to start out a little bit, a little bit about me and my story, and then uh, we're going to then uh, progress into uh, the language that we use around physician well-being. I'm then going to talk briefly about um, ways to support individual physicians um, when they're struggling with mental health issues and otherwise. And then we're going to get into the meat of it. We're going to talk about systems level changes that can help with physician well-being. Um, and at the end, if you will let me, I will wax a little bit poetic about some thoughts I have about the future of the well-being movement. All right. So here we go. It's chapter one, in my story, a beautiful mess. Um, so these are uh, my boys. Um, I have two and a friend uh, there. They were making me a very beautiful mess with that big pink chalk uh, heart. All right. So uh, some of you might know me academically. Um, I do a suicide prevention work with uh, David Brent over at UPMC at the Star Center. Um, I've been a fiery mental health advocate when 13 Reasons Why on Netflix came on. Um, I fought the good fight around trying to help um, decrease uh, risk for vulnerable youth. And we even got Netflix to remove the, the uh, graphic scene of the protagonist's death by suicide um, in that very popular series, 13 Reasons Why. And more recently, I put my fiery advocacy towards um, being a well-being champion, uh, both locally and then nationally. And uh, part of that has also been becoming a physician coach, which has been an awful lot of fun. And then ultimately, I am a proud academic mom, um, where I am a program director, as Misty mentioned, for Child and Triple Board. So about a decade ago, um, this was my family. Um, everything looked pretty darn picturesque. This is, uh, if you come to Pittsburgh, um, you definitely have to check out McConnell's Mill and the hiking paths near this beautiful um, creek up north. And then on May 29th, 2016, I was up in Vermont for a conference um, and uh, it happened to be Father's Day weekend. And so I went and visited my parents. I grew up in Vermont. And I remember at brunch um, saying to them that everything was going really marvelously and my career was really taking off. And I had these two beautiful children and this beautiful life. And yet I was uh, feeling alone. And uh, I, I was feeling like, um, my marriage um, felt uh, distant, and I felt like um, I wasn't in it together anymore with my husband. And you know, and and I I um, conceptualized it that we were both hardworking physicians that. Um, the adult relationships we had at work um, were really important ones, and the work we were doing at home was really focused on the kids at the time. 
And I remember my mom, she asked me, you know, uh, do you think your husband's having an affair? And I just thought, no, absolutely not. And she planted the seed though. And, you know, I did realize that the relationship was not going well. And so when I, I got back to Pittsburgh, um, started some really challenging conversations and that proceeded over the course of uh, a year. And over that year, um, it became pretty apparent that um, the relationship wasn't going to be salvageable. And I was pretty heartbroken. I had two little boys and this life that felt like it was really um, what I wanted. And all of a sudden it was all sort of crumbling beneath me. And um, at that time, um, I conceptualized it as, well, of course I'm upset. Of course I'm sad. Of course I'm breaking into tears when people ask me if I'm okay at work. And it ultimately took um, an app and my mother asking me if I thought I was depressed. For me, someone who literally screens for major depressive disorder multiple times every day in clinic um, to realize that I actually was meeting uh, full criteria for a major depressive episode. And the truth of the matter is we just don't always see it in ourselves. Because as you know, um, while I'm not immune, you aren't either. In fact, physicians um, have rates of depression that exceed the general population in one study, 12% uh, of male physicians and nearly 20% of female physicians. Substance use disorders as well, we don't like to talk about that, right? Um, and yet we are at the same risk as the general population for substance use. And then suicide, while suicide in general remains rare, um, we do um, have higher rates than the general population, especially women. Um, and most recently, it's been found in one study that about 119 physicians die annually by suicide in the U.S. What do we know about suicide in physicians? Well, interestingly and sadly, we know that while we have similar rates to mental health disorders, we are less likely to have been receiving mental health treatment at the time of death. Um, the postmortem toxicology of physicians who've died by suicide show lower rates of antidepressants. Um, and we know um, from this research uh, study that um, while the general population is more likely to have had a recent personal life crisis or is suffering from acute grief or, um, in their personal lives, a physician who dies by suicide um, is more likely to actually have had a job problem acutely. We also know timing. We know that um, the risk for death by suicide in physicians is highest mid to late career. Um, and while trainee suicide is relatively rare, um, these young people are healthy generally. And so it's actually the number one cause of death in male residents and the number two cause of death in female residents following cancer. Now I'm a program director. And so this study is really um, something that I want all program directors and people who work with residents to know about. So ACGME um, looked at nearly 10,000 programs and they were able to find that the highest risk for resident suicide um, actually has a temporal quality. It's um, specifically in the intern year and that there are peaks uh, in the first and the third quarter of the academic year. You can see that here, the suicidal ideation um, showed an increase of 370% uh, in those first three months of the intern year. So you've just become uh, from a medical student to a physician with all of that pressure um, to know and to be and to save lives. And yet just yesterday, you were a medical student. Of course, that time of transition is hugely stressful. Um, and something that we need to know about. Furthermore, we know that physicians have low rates of, of help seeking. And so this study is, is chilling to me. Um, so it was a cross-sectional study of surgeons, um, nearly 8,000 of them. And while one in 16 admitted to suicidal thoughts in the past year, only one in four sought professional help. And why? Well, physicians claim that it's time, that's inconvenient, there's confidentiality and stigma, um, cost as well. And um, so these are the reasons why physicians think they aren't seeking care. And yet we also know that physicians and people who um, are attracted to uh, these giving fields um, do have uh, 
certain character traits um, in our profession, right? That maladaptive perfectionism in medicine is a real thing. And we are the type of people who are attracted to the field. Um, so this desire for control, the desire to um, have a sense of self-sufficiency that we can do it on our own, and sometimes even maybe less so for psychiatrists, or maybe more so for psychiatrists, suppression of feelings, right? Um, and as I did, um, intellectualizing what was happening to me. And self-stigma starts early. So look at this study. It's really interesting. Um, it shows that especially when medical students are depressed, they're, they're especially fearful of what would happen if they confided in others about their struggles. So this one says more than 50% said telling a counselor that I am depressed would be risky. Um, and that nearly 50% of them said, um, uh, or only 50% of them said that they would seek treatment. Okay. Uh, this one really like hurts me um, to think that a depressed medical student, nearly 50% of them thought that seeking mental health help um, for mental illness would make them feel less intelligent. I mean, that's mind boggling, right? And if we think about uh, the great minds of the world and the great artists and um, you know, the, the, the prevalence of mental illness that we know about and people who've changed the world um, is, is real, right? And yet depressed medical students um, conceptualize that they are alone. And in fact, as a program director and someone who specializes in suicide prevention and in well-being, I've, I've talked to um, students and residents before who have been in, in moments of crisis. Um, and I had this really interesting experience where I helped um, a resident whose um, resident peers were concerned about um, them because uh, they had confided that they were having suicidal thoughts and, and, and they were starting to think about when they would act on them. And so they were brought to me, not as, you know, the mental health provider, but as sort of a trusted colleague. And I remember thinking, wow, this is such a moment. I get to help out this person, help connect them to care. And it felt really important and really good. Um, and so a decade or so later, I talked to that person again to say, hey, how did that night go for you? Because from my perspective, it was hard, but it felt important and good. Um, and they said to me, Honestly, when I was talking to you, I thought and I was certain that this would be the end of my career, right? Um, and, and that hadn't even crossed my mind. Uh, and yet um, that was the reason why they hadn't even sought mental health care for themselves earlier. The fact of the matter is we all struggle. And here I am with my uh, triple uh, ACL, MCL, medial meniscus, and plus one uh, lateral meniscus tears um, in the year that I was um, trying to um, get through my challenging divorce. And, you know, those are my residents of the time, um, Becky Miller and Sarah Shad. And boy, were they taking care of me um, with my crutches and the rest. Um, but they were also really aware it was a hard time for me, um, and they were supporting me emotionally too. And so, the, you know, the question really is, what if we did model what it takes to thrive, right? What if someone who's further along in training um, acknowledged that they were struggling and even acknowledged that they were seeking help because they were struggling? Well, interestingly, our friends at Yale have studied that. And what did Andreas Martin and Julie, Julie Chilton and friends find? Well, they found that 91% of medical students either agreed or strongly agreed that they'd be more likely to seek help um, if they knew that someone further in their career had done so um, and it had helped them. So modeling is so deeply important. All right, chapter two. I'm going to talk about the words. This is terminology time. Feelings, dragons. Um, so this is my son uh, at three years of age. Um, he insisted on writing down all of these emotions. Uh, God bless children of psychiatrists. All right. So terminology. What terminology do you want to use? Well, we know physicians have unique stressors, and I'm not going to belabor that to this audience, but the pandemic just ended that alone was acute and chronic stress. But even before that, right, we had medical errors and morbidity and mortality, um, e even um, issues related to malpractice um, or difficult patient outcomes, right? Uh, and then the chronic stuff, um, difficulty unplugging, workload compression, and now what we're really feeling, I think, ever across the nation is just staffage shortages um, and, and, you know, really being stretched thin in what we are asked to do. 
So I just really want to drive this home. Um, I was watching Carol Bernstein give a talk recently, and she had this, uh, they, they published this paper in JAMA Psychiatry um, that, that you know, basically said it's critical that burnout not become the catch-all term for all emotional distress expressed by physicians, right? Um, that burnout is really an occupational stress if you take time away from it, um, if you um, are able to uh, address it with meaningful ways, it should subside, right? While depression, and this audience knows very well, um, is something very different, right? It's a mood disorder. It can come even without a life stressor, um, and it can respond to evidence-based treatment that we know well, um, and we haven't quite figured out the same for burnout yet. We are not immune in psychiatry, and this number goes up and down. Um, but you can see here that in the 2023 uh, Medscape survey, for better or for worse, um, that 38% of psychiatrists were endorsing um, uh, burnout in that survey. So what contributes to burnout? We know this, right? It's the, the bureaucratic tasks that have nothing to do with being a doctor. Um, it's the EHR, right? It's the lack of control and autonomy. Um, it's the, that, um, the, the, the compression um, and all that we're asked to do, right? And so these are contributing to this, you know, Maslow's triad of just not thriving at work. And it can affect both personal and professional aspects of who we are as, as doctors, right? So we see more divorce, we see more substance use, we see more depression, but we also see lower um, uh, satisfaction of our patients and increased um, uh, uh, medical um, negative outcomes. The one thing that we can say, at least right now, is that in the research, um, burnout has many potential negative outcomes, and yet, it has not been shown to be an independent variable um, contributing to suicide. All right, what else do we know about burnout? Well, we know that women and men and sexual minorities experience burnout potentially differently, um, that women are more likely to be emotionally exhausted and men uh, more likely to have depersonalization, um, while LGBT minority physicians face uh, unique sexual and gender discrimination challenges that contribute even further. And we know that um, furthermore, uh, racial and ethnic minorities um, within our fields and our profession um, are experiencing a variety of additional stressors on top of the stressors already mentioned, including microaggressions, macroaggressions, discrimination, minority tax, and the rest. So what do we know about trends of burnout? Well, this well-being movement has been going on for a while, so one would think we would be getting better. Um, and yet you can see here that the physician burnout rates um, continue to be problematic, and we're really not making uh, tremendous progress. So is it just burnout? Are we measuring the right things? Um, we've talked about burnout as being an occupational stress phenomenon, uh, but we're starting to think about other factors as to why physicians are struggling. Um, at University of Pittsburgh, we've done a, a research protocol on our incoming interns, where we looked at moral injury and disenchantment. So. Um, you know, physicians come in with, with very um, moral, deeply held values and beliefs about why we're going into this help-seeking field, right? And when we go into these very challenging circumstances, it doesn't always go in the way that we think. Um, and in fact, sometimes the kind of work that we're capable of doing is not the kind of work that feels satisfactory to our patients or our communities or our profession. And that can cause uh, incidents of moral injury. And over the state of time, um, if there's more and more incidents of moral injury, uh, then a state of disillusionment can happen with one's work, um, which has been termed disenchantment. So what did we find of our interns? Um, well, we surveyed them uh, in 2020 and then uh, 2021 at the end of the academic year, the beginning and the end. Um, and you can see here that our residents came in as expected with nearly all of them idealizing medicine as profession and 93.4 of them saying they would choose it again, even with all that debt and all that time and those sleepless nights and their steps and the rest. And yet by the end of the first year of training, we start to see a change. 
While 92% of our uh, residents still idealize medicine, 67.7 um, of them had experienced a significant reduction in that idealization. 53.3% of them felt like they had witnessed or experienced things that they thought were morally wrong just in that first year. And 18.6% said they would not choose the profession again. Furthermore, 39.5% said they would not encourage their kids to choose a profession in medicine, which is double the baseline. Now we're trying to understand um, the data and understand uh, vulnerabilities and factors that contribute to this. But interestingly, disenchantment wasn't associated with age or gender, income, or um, other demographic factors. Um, and so it, it'll take some time and some research to figure it out. But certainly having that high level of moral attentiveness um, was something that drove disenchantment faster. All right, what else? Is it you know, not just burnout? What about loneliness? If you haven't heard um, our former US Surgeon General Vic Murphy speak on loneliness, it's very powerful. Um, I, I got to hear him talk at the National Academy of Medicine and um, it's, it's, it's compelling. Um, we know that people who are socially connected are happier, right? We know that this actually helps not just physical but mental health outcomes and that having meaningful relationships um, is not only uh, a, a major factor in happiness. So that big um, uh, Harvard study, that was the 75 year study um, that looked at keys to a long life and happiness. But we also know that meaningful relationships are neuroprotective, um, that you're more likely to have better memory and uh, uh, later cognitive decline. So we know all these things, right? And yet look at this, um, over the past decade, we are getting more and more socially isolated. Our companionship is going down. Our social engagement is plummeting. Now, mind you, is the pandemic. And yet, what does this really mean? And how are we valuing our relationships in a way that maybe is self-destructive? Well, one of the factors as a child psychiatrist, I can't help but mention, uh, you know, we've done some research in Pittsburgh to look at screen time. Screen time is not just a teenage issue, right? Um, screen time is real. And um, uh, this study here found that young adults who engaged in more than two hours of social media a day doubled their risk of feeling socially isolated. All right. We also know that passive screen time, right, that, you know, the scrolling without the engaging, without the meaningful relationships um, is, is a potential for increasing um, depressive symptoms and loneliness symptoms. And furthermore, for every 10% increase in social media um, that's, that's positive, um, you, you get only like a 13% increase in, in that experience, but um, there's no change uh, in uh, the, the um, experience of um, loneliness or social connectedness um, as you get more and more social media hit. So even though you're looking for the dopamine hit, um, you're not actually improving uh, your connectedness or issues related to um, wellness. All right, so chapter three, the individual. Um, so let's chat a little bit about physicians who are struggling and what we can do to help them whether it's burnout or stress, anxiety, depression, uh, what can we do to help our colleagues and help ourselves? Well, number one, physicians not only need to know how to access help, but they know, need to know the practical implications of doing so. Um, and so I was hired by our DIO at UPMC. We have the second largest GME in the nation, 2000 residents and fellows across the entire system. Um, and so Dr. Rita Patel, when she hired us, she saw in the pipeline um, that section 6C AC GME requirements saying that we physicians needed to train our residents and fellows and faculty about these six topics, burnout, fatigue, depression, suicide, substance use, and risk for violence. And so uh, when I was hired, we decided to take this on really seriously and not just a checkbox. And so what we did is we built this amazing um, committee and subcommittees for each of these sections. And they were all physicians who then worked with other experts from across the nation to build the content. And so this is designed by physicians for physicians, right? And it's free. It's 
online, and it's really intended for clinician educators, program directors, and well-being champions to utilize these PowerPoints and FAQs and what have you um, in small group settings in your community, and you can um, actually uh, modify them to meet the needs of your community. So please feel free um, to download what's helpful for you, uh, teach away, and get in touch with us if you want to contribute um, or give feedback on the experience of using the Well Toolkit. We've had more than 17,000 um, visits um, to the toolkit so far. Um, and every time I talk about it, um, I get a couple extra hits, um, which is great because that means that we're spreading the good word and improving the tool itself. All right, so what kinds of things can you find in the toolkit? Well, in the introduction section, um, if you're a leader, you can find ways to improve well-being within your system, right? So if you if you have um, physicians who work for you, they should know the actual questions that are on hospital credentialing and insurance malpractice forms. They should know exactly what would happen if they needed to take time off from work to seek mental health care. Who would need to know? Um, would their boss need to know? Would the employee assistance program need to know? Would HR need to know? Would legal need to know, right? They need to know. Um, and then uh, physicians also need to understand the relevant policies around uh, leave and support. So you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the ADA um, and guidelines related to state, state licensure. Um, and you know, basically ADA says, we should not be asking professionals about mental health disorders unless it's causing current impairment, right? Simple, easy. Do we do that in medicine? Not necessarily. So you can see here in this 2020 study um, that it's a whole variety of the kinds of questions that are asked on state licensure for medical licensing. Um, so we're, we're not following those ADA rules. Though I will say, I looked this up for you guys in California here, as of August, 2022, um, there was further auditing um, of uh, the language in the licensure applications. And California was named one of those states where applications are consistent with the Laura Breen, uh, Lorna Breen advocacy recommendations. So way to go, California. All right, so you'll see in the toolkit also, you can substitute your language um, from your institution in these slides, right? So this is literally cut and paste from our hospital privileging questionnaire. So a physician can know what are the questions that I'm gonna have to answer or what is a peer going to have to answer about me when I'm being hired, when I'm uh, credentialing, when I'm, when I'm going up for promotion and what have you. We also created um, this uh, flow sheet so that physicians who have um, active impairing substance use disorders understand what would happen and what are the steps related to self-disclosure of their illness and or if they were discovered. Um, and so it, it was very challenging to put this together. And, you know, it really takes the work of a thoughtful uh, HR and legal and uh, physician well-being team to do it. But how important, because we know actually that physicians who seek help for substance use disorders have much better outcomes than the general population and they deserve that care. The second thing that I did when I first joined on as the co-chair of the Wellbeing Committee for our GME was to try to just help our residents, fellows, and attendings know what resources actually already existed. We were resource rich, and you guys are too. I've had a really fun time learning about some of the uh, mental health support services that are available to your trainees and to attendings um, through the, the Behavioral Wellness Center. Um, and so, you know, how, how do people know how to access these things. Well, generally people like turn me, you know, turn the volume off um, when they're in orientation, we're talking about these services because they're like, ah, I don't need that until they do, right? And so we created this highly visible, recognizable flyer so that whenever a physician or someone who's supporting a physician needs to know where support is for different types of issues, um, that they can access it on a one-page flyer that has a QR code. And you're welcome to use the QR code to get to the website, download your own well flyer and make your own version of this. All right, so I'm going to highlight a couple things on our well flyer. Um, so we, just like your uh, behavioral health center, the wellness center, um, have something called Life Solutions or the Physician's Assistance Program. The residence version is called RFAP, Residence Fellows Assistance Program. We, we basically rebranded our EAP 
from an employee assistance program to a physician's assistance program. Because what doctor wants to consider themselves an employee? Like none of them were using it. So we changed the language and they started to come. In fact, we have about 7% of our GME accessing um, the RFAP just last year. That's 275 trainees with nearly 1,000 documented hours of support. Um, and you guys have the uh, like a coaching app as well, um, the uh, the Ginger app, I believe it is. We have something like that too, the RX Well for sort of coaching around well-being factors. Uh, but RFAP also provides um, not just mental health support, but support around. Um, seeking child care, seeking legal counsel, um, seeking elder care, housing um, uh, searches, and, and uh, other life-related activities, which is really nice for our trainees. We also used to have test-taking support, and that was highly utilized. I hope they bring that back because that person is no longer at the center, but I think it's something that we need. So this is my baby. Um, I was talking to um, your colleagues earlier this morning about this. So this is not a mental health um, program. It's just a concierge service. Curbside is intended to allow any doctor, resident fellow, or attending to call a phone number and say, I think I have symptoms of depression or you know, uh, my child has symptoms of ADHD. I really need to get into a mental health uh, professional um, and I want to get it um, outside of the institution because I'm not willing to get my care under the roof where I work. Um, or they can use it and say, I'm okay with getting help within the institution. I just don't know how to navigate the systems, right? And so then they can give as much or as little identifying information as they'd like. Um, and the curbside clinician then helps that person um, uh, within one week get uh, two to three uh, recommendations for mental health providers who have agreed to take on physicians um, through our database. And so you can see here, um, we had 83 um, physicians use uh, the system last year. Um, and the, the primary reasons why people are using the, this concierge service was anxiety, stress, uh, and other uh, family and relationship related um, stressors. All right, some of you may or may not be familiar with this, but we also bought into this model because obviously curbside, you gotta pick up the phone. And um, I'm a training director of millennials. I don't think they even know that you talk into a phone. They're not so fond of that concept. And so we wanted to make sure that there was a way to access important care through texting, through talking, through typing, um, any way that we can get to physicians in a way that they feel comfortable. So I love this program. It's through the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, AFSP, and it's called the Interactive Screening Program. Basically what happens is as a physician, you log into the system, you create your own unique identifier and password. So it doesn't have to have any contact to your identity or your work or anything, right? It's truly anonymous. And then you fill out this questionnaire that has everything from sleep and substance and depression and even suicide questions. Um, and uh, so that you can self-survey yourself, all right? To find out how am I doing? Then a, um, a uh, ISP clinician who's also part of the, the Life Solutions Group um, will uh, receive that electronic submission and they will review um, the results and then they will write back a individualized uh, message through the secure server to that physician who filled it out that says something like I noticed that you know you mentioned you're going through a divorce and that you know you're on this rotation that's really challenging your it looks like your sleep um you know, score is very high. I'm wondering if perhaps you'd like to connect with a therapist related to X, Y, or Z, right? So it's a, it's a, it's both an analysis of that survey, but also a human touch. And so how is it received? Well, wow. Um, within uh, this first um, cohort, we found that um, 209 of our residents and fellows submitted um, a questionnaire and uh, the good majority of them um, came back to review the comments. And then uh, you can see here that they're quite distressed, right? Um, that blue uh, um, uh, wedge of the graph, 17% uh, acknowledged they were having suicidal thoughts um, and 47% acknowledged they were having high distress. People who are going to self-screen in this very private way tend to be pretty distressed physicians, um, how important for them to 
have a little bit more realization of, of, of how bad it is and to actually see it. Just like I, you know, when I did my own um, scale, I don't think I knew it until I saw it, right? We're scientists. And so here are some quotes of folks who've actually used the ISP and gave feedback um, through our survey. I thought these two were really nice. Um, so one resident said, you know what, thanks for really hearing me out. I appreciated the time and the response. I've been long contemplating seeking therapy, and yet I think now is the time, right? It was, it was just enough to push that person to get help. Um, similarly, this other one um, said, I have thought a lot about what you said, and I waited some time, but things aren't improving, so I'm finally going to call, right? And so um, while you in the database, you're not seeing necessarily that people are going directly from the questionnaire to help seeking. For some people, it's just planting that seed. So when they get to a point where they're ready, they will reach out, hopefully. All right, what else do we have? We have the Physicians for Physicians program. That's a peer support program, and about 50 to 100 people use that per year. Um, and then obviously, there are local resources for crisis, as well as national resources, which I won't belabor the point, but you can have my slides later. Um, because at the end of the day, we need these resources. We need to break the culture of maladaptive perfectionism in medicine. And we need physicians to know that um, it's okay to seek help, right? Because a distressed colleague might not ask for help, but that doesn't need mean that it's not needed or not wanted. And so going back to that story I told you of that physician who I helped through that crisis moment, um, they acknowledge it was absolutely not what I wanted, the help I was giving them at that time, and acts and exactly what I needed. All right, the system. So for you well-being champions out there, it's not all about mental illness, right? Um, physicians are struggling, and um, we know that if we continue to just focus on the individual, um, we're missing the boat, right? Um, so it, words like wellness and resilience, they make me cringe too. And that's because um, if we're not acknowledging the system contributors to burnout, then we're really missing the point. All right, so we fought the good fight before and I can give you these flyers. Um, there are ways to let um, uh, hospital leadership know um, why it's important to invest in leadership, in money, um, in time, in well-being advocacy, because ultimately um, it actually is, there's a business case, it's cost-effective um, and it, it improves um, a care, it improves retention um, and ultimately um, helps overall in a health system. And we know that both individual and organizational wellness strategies have shown evidence base to decrease burnout um, and improve some of these factors of well-being. So here, here, I'm here with you guys, but back home in University of Pittsburgh, um, we have actually had an annual well-being symposium. And um, one of the most um, sought after sections of that is the executive panel. Um, and it's an opportunity for well-being champions such as myself to help field questions from the everyday physician um, at our institution to the upper level C-suite executives at UPMC and ask those really hard questions. And some of the questions are really hard, um, but that visibility has been hugely well received. And because of, what's my time to remind me, I'm exactly on time, here we go. All right, and because of, um, the investment of the institution in the well-being initiatives, we actually have both an attending um, leadership uh, role. So they're co-chairs of UPMC Physician Thrive, which is attending physicians, and they report straight up um, to those C-suite executives and vice presidents of the hospital system. And then uh, myself and Vu Nguyen, who's a plastic surgeon, we report up to the DIO um, doing GME wellness. And then you can see there, I listed all the names of the folks who are most recently well being champions on that committee. There are lots of people. Um, we meet regularly. We have subcommittees, um, and it's a really vibrant community um, where we know each other. We like each other, and it's uh, a, a really meaningful 10% of my job because here are some of the cool things that we've done um, through the Well and Thrive committees, right? So I'm going to highlight a couple of them just in the interest of time. I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but we are starting to recognize that these kinds of initiatives are being appreciated by physicians. So which ones? Well, this year um, we've really pushed hard on uh, a 
a, a physician peer coaching program um, where we're training up about 20 uh, physician peer coaches twice annually, annually to become um, certified coaches and provide uh, professional support to other physicians who've stagnated in their profession or are struggling with interpersonal issues at work or trying to um, find direction um, and meaning again in being a physician. And the truth of the matter is our physician well-being champions we recognize that while we are fighting the good fight and we you know, dream together, we might not have all the answers. And so I really love this idea of the Physician Thrive Grants for Change. Um, and so every once in a while, we put it out there that any physician can submit for a grant um, to pay for an innovative intervention um, within their own smaller department um, to see if possibly it could be leveraged at a higher level. And so those system changing grants, we give up to $10,000 um, where the more focused project grants are, um, are usually one-offs um, up to $1,000. We also institute um, a, a um, every other year um, system-wide physician and APP well-being survey. Um, and so we're tracking over time how well-being is going. And, and so now we're on our third iteration. Um, and the neat thing about this is um, we dissected the data and sure enough, our data looks similar to everywhere else, but we're seeing some positive things. So for instance, this one, um, we found that um, the attending physicians said that they felt it was either moderately or completely true um, that their uh, input was valued in important administrative decisions. That ticked up from 48% to 58% um, over the course of two years. So whatever we're doing, hopefully this is a sign that at least physicians feel like they're at the table where the, where the conversation is happening. And at the program director level or at the division level, you would get a report like this after um, your physicians filled out a survey. And you get sort of the granular data of, all right, fine, I, I know where my uh, burnout and professional fulfillment, you know, numbers are, but that I need to know more about, um, you know, what's getting better and what's getting worse. And so, you know, in this um, in this report, you can see um, that uh, the, the physicians who answered it compared to last time that they, they answered it, they feel really satisfied that there's improved control over schedule, that there's improved um, personal organizational values alignment. Interestingly, these all that green, which is really positive, doesn't necessarily equate to improved burnout or professional fulfillment though. All right. So what do you do once you get that survey data? Well, there are a lot of things you could do, but one is you can do an appreciative inquiry. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this, but our residents do every other year a half day workshop where they use this model, um, discover, dream, design, deliver, to determine where we need to be putting our efforts going forward. And here are some outcomes of things we've done, right? So we actually now have a chief resident of well-being um, within the Department of Psychiatry. Um, we have, uh, we hire a psychologist um, specifically just 10% of their time just for the psychiatry residents because we have 80 plus residents and fellows and the EAP unfortunately you know it was not necessarily feeling confidential enough for them so we found another way to help bridge so and provide supportive care for them. Um, you can see here some of them don't even cost money right just standardized rounding times and attending grand rounds together in person um, setting a sense of community having well-being lunches and the rest. One of the things that's really important that came out of dreaming aloud with physicians and residents was that they wanted to have something very um, uh, practical and interactive and important um, around Jedi and D the DI movement. And so we've actually developed um, a four year rolling curriculum um, where our, all of our residents um, have 40 hours of training related to topics um, around um, respect, responsibility and equity in medicine. All right. Last section, um, hope, the golden outhouse. I'll tell you the story sometime, but basically um, that sweet little uh, charm is uh, fell off of my grandmother's bracelet when my house is broken into. Um, and I keep it on my windowsill because it reminds me that even when really hard things happen, um, there are small reminders that amazing things exist, even if they're small. 
And so I want to talk to you about my thoughts about the well-being movement and the direction we're going. When I started this journey back in 2015, um, wellness was yoga and broccoli, right? And yet um, it, we, we, we did not hit the right note. And so by 2018, we were fighting the good fight, right? Fighting against um, the systems that were contributing to our burnout, making physicians' jobs more meaningful and more effective and more efficient. I'm wondering now, though, now that we've been fighting the good fight, and the system remains clunky, and it will, right? We're not going to fix healthcare system overnight. Is 2023 the time that we start to think about ourselves again and go back in a full circle? And so I like to sort of conceptualize this in dialectical thinking, right? Um, so the concept is, yeah, all right. So the system is broken. Can I also say that in the same duality that I find my job and my work as a physician meaningful, right? I can be both frustrated at the contributors to burnout and choosing to control what I control. I can take pride in my grit and I can choose to acknowledge my vulnerability and work on my resilience, right? It doesn't have to be either or. It does not have to be work-life balance. We do not need to necessarily do what we're doing in terms of villainizing work and putting ourselves in a victim model where we're not feeling like we can get better because we can. Because look at these clinical critical characteristics of resilience, right? Realistic optimism, like humor, strong supportive relationships, the ability to face fears and go outside of comfort zone. These are for the general population. If you look at these, you're a doctor, like you have these two, we have it in us to be have self-efficacy. And so if you haven't seen Dr. Lucy Holmes' TED Talk, she came and she gave our plenary at our well-being symposium. It was amazing. Um, but she talks about a variety of things. Um, and you know, this is a, a resilience researcher and expert who has embraced the concept of um, shifting away from why me and acknowledging with radical acceptance that bad things happen. And your ears really pop up because this is not only a PhD with resilience um, expertise, but she's also someone who had lost her own child tragically. And so she's lived it, she's tried it, and she talks about it in this amazing way. And she talks about really focusing in on what is good and the things that you can control and the things that matter, right? And asking yourself regularly, right? you take nothing else from this talk, is what I'm doing helping me or harming me? Um, I actually ask myself that regularly all the time. So um, here are a couple of other ideas that I want you to think about. Um, we do this physician connection series. It's basically just like an Oprah interview of a doctor talking about their vulnerabilities on stage. Um, pretty fun stuff and a good cocktail hour. Um, we can find meaning in communities, like a clinician ed educator track, right? Meaning doesn't have to come just from being together in a cocktail hour. It can be because we're working together towards important things. And then finding meaning together and giving back and advocacy. Um, so here are some uh, wonderful friends from ACAP and the MSR committee and the legislative conference. And we can find meaning by being together and being intentional about being together. And I just want to say that I've seen that here at your institution, and I'm grateful to have um, tasted a little bit of what your community is capable of. And I just want to thank you again, um, because better is possible. It does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity. It takes ingenuity. And above all, it takes a willingness to try. And just by inviting me here, um, having this talk um, and, and talking with your community really proves to me that that's where your community is. So thank you so, so much. Um, there is my uh, modern blended new family and my new adventure. And uh, for those of you who are struggling right now, I see you, I've been there, and I will say that there um, can definitely be hope that's different than maybe what you have right now. Ah, Nancy, that was just so, just meaningful and impactful. Thank you. I'm getting all of these texts that are just like, who is she and how can we get her here and do all the things? And you are um, just, the way you embrace the dialectic, and model of vulnerability coupled with action is so powerful and inspiring. Thank you.
we have some questions and I know we have a few minutes. I only left four minutes. I didn't do so well with that. We can do it. No, it was beautiful. Um, so the first question is, um, thank you for caring about the well-being of physicians. What if the primary cause of burnout and depression are due to interpersonal conflicts the physician is having with particular attendings or with coworkers on a unit? Does clinical support ever go beyond the individual to include mediation within the system? That's such a great question, right? We were chatting about this this morning. That was a question I think that came up with the medical students yesterday, right? Absolutely. Um, because, you know, it goes back to relationships, right? We are human um, creatures who crave connectedness, right? And, you know, Zoom and the pandemic and everything has fractured that. And so then when you come in and you're expecting to have a collaborative, amazing experience with colleagues or with a supervisor, and that doesn't happen, it's like almost worse than staying behind the Zoom or in the dark room and not coming out at all, right? And, you know, and we are, we're seeing that, that people um, are, when they are burned out, when they are stressed, they're not necessarily their best selves. And so it's so common to have interpersonal struggles in the workplace. Um, you know, one thing that I think, you know, came out of the discussion yesterday is um, we are capable as mental health professionals of really having theory of mind and um, thinking about sitting in someone else's shoes, right? And so, um, First, acknowledging that if someone's being unprofessional, that maybe they are struggling too. Um, but also not allowing that to just happen to yourself, right? Um, whether that means upstanding or that means getting support yourself, or if it's a chronic relationship issue, maybe accessing something like coaching um, could be really meaningful so that it doesn't contribute to your misery as a professional. Beautiful response and get, maybe getting outside of these Zoom boxes and seeing each other, like right. just seeing our faces. I, I know. I can't wait to have lunch with the residents. I hope you're out there. <laughs> Come hang out with me. Three minutes. Okay. So another question is, is there any difference between MDs and an HMO like Kaiser versus universities or independent MDs in private practice in terms of seeking mental health support? Mm. That's a great question. I don't know that answer, but I will uh, try to find it out for you. I mean, the, if you are interested in research in well-being, come join. There are so many questions to be asked. And to be honest, most well-being champions are not great researchers. There are some amazing ones, but most of us are clinician educators, we're advocates, what have you. And so if you're interested in a career trajectory that's looking at something new and asking important questions like that one, come on board. Um, there's data to be analyzed. Perfect. And one more question and then a statement at the end. Is there any link between physicians who don't have a religious background versus those that do for an increase in stress or depression? Yeah, so um, clinically, we know that um, religion can be protective and protective um, related to uh, depression, suicide, what have you. And um, so certainly, um, but you know, if you're not a person of faith, we also know that just having um, naturalistic communities and connectedness um, can serve uh, an important protective role too. So you, certainly one needn't have that, but it most certainly um, can be helpful if it's a positive role within one's identity and within one's realm. So um, leaning into these things that make us human is, is I think, part of the, the way out. Wonderful. There, there are so many questions, Sansi, and I realize it is noon, and so maybe we can continue this discussion during lunch. I'll end on one comment by our very own Dr. Bearden. Wow. Thank you for an incredible talk, Dr. Jacobson. This is so important, and I so appreciate your honesty and thoughtfulness. Thanks for inspiring all of us to strive towards this. Thank you. I'm really, really honored, and um, please. Um, if you want to be part of this movement, um, don't hesitate. You are not an imposter. Um, we, are, we are all flawed and vulnerable and not okay at times. And that's part of the reason why you're going to thrive in your careers. And so if you're interested in doing this kind of work, we'd love to have you. Don't hesitate to shoot an email. Thank you. Thank you.